Well, what must the church realize? <clears throat> uh, we've got a fight in front of us. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. You've professed your faith in him before witnesses. And um, now lay hold on that eternal life, live that life, but in the midst of it, you have to fight the good fight. Here's what we need to know by way of introduction. The world, spurred on by Satan, is at war with the church. And I say the church because that's who we are. We are the assembled saints, baptized saints. Christ explained this. John 15, 18, and 19. If the world hate you, you see, it's not just is mildly irritated. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of this world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Let us settle on that. Um... We're going, I'm going to be sharing with you what I discovered when I was researching the word beware in the New Testament. And I found that there are two main topics that Christ was worried, that Christ and the apostles were worried, that, we might, that might miss our awareness. But this is the deal. And so we fight this battle daily because we live in the world we're not of the world, but we're in the world. And so in 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. We fight it daily. This is ongoing. Fight the good fight of faith. Keep on fighting. However, and this is, this is that warning that we kind of brought out during the uh, Sunday school thing with the jailer. The church is not at war with unbelievers. Our job is to love them to Jesus. If we can. Doing whatever we can to influence them. <clears throat> to show them there's a different way of life. Listen to two passages. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 and the Lord make you to increase, he says to the church, and abound in love. Of course, one toward another. Support one another. But also toward all men, even as we do toward you. The point here is that I loved you, Paul is writing, before you were saved. I came to your pagan land to witness to you, you see. Loving all men. And in 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7, the, the seven steps of growth. Besides this, giving all diligence, hard work, add to your faith. Once you're saved, add to your faith. Then he mentions virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge temperance, to temperance patience, to patience godliness, to godliness. Add brotherly kindness. This is actually the word uh, brother love. And this is the fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Show your love to them. This is how we exercise our love and grow to where we can get to this last step. Add to brotherly kindness, charity. This is that word agape, the true Christian love. So how do we do this? We love the sinner but hate the sin. So here's what we have to recognize. We can become disgruntled, upset, angry, uh, seething in hatred. But we have to remember this, that people are sinners, and sinners do bad things. It is not as though they had the choice to act like a Christian when they're not saved. Our minds are darkened, our heart is hardened. Satan himself has blinded their eyes. 
So do not adopt hatred for the sinners, but for their sin. The thing is, pity them. Uh, I found that when people are offensive to me, uh, for me to look at them correctly, I have to first pity them. I have to first say, that's just, they're just acting out what's in their heart. I have to pity them. Pity their ignorance. They hurt themselves in their ignorance more than they do others. You see, if you were to listen to the law of God, something else would happen. Deuteronomy 5.29, God says to Moses, Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments. Deuteronomy 5 is where the second time where he gave the law. Deuteronomy is Deutero, second, and Namus law, second giving of the law. This was just before they got into the promised land. But he says, oh, I wish that they would fear me and in, in that fear keep all of my commandments. And why? Why does God want us to keep his commandments? That it might be well with them and with their children forever. Do you see the compassion of it? Is that when they do against what I've said, they hurt themselves and their families, their communities. Listen to it in Acts 2.40. Peter is preaching. With many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. It's, it's, it's a picture of you're hurting yourself. You're, you're losing yourself. Save yourself. Deliver yourself. And to... Timothy, Paul writes, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And the being deceived part here is they don't know any better. They, when you're really deceived, you think it's true. You catch that? <laughs> we look around and we say, why, why are all the people lying to the people about these things? They're convinced it's true. Or at least it's true enough that it's better than other things. So, let me say to you that as I summarized what I was learning from studying the word beware, I found that God warns us of two great enemies that seek to defeat the church. Now, only two. I was, I was a little surprised at that. I was expecting to break it up into uh, various parts. But uh, I want to give you all of the verses that deal with it and just uh, arrange it then so you can follow it. The first of the two great enemies are false teachers. False teachers compete with the truth. I was uh, looking up the first name of uh, William Newell. I quote him in my messages today, and I forgot his first name. So I was looking it up, and uh, the, one of the things that had his name, William R. Newell, was uh, commenting on his really wonderful commentary on Romans. And I thought, what a strange thing to take all this time and effort to talk about it this way. He says, not being a philosopher, he had never learned to... Um, uh, the, the art of, uh, um, uh, what, what's the word, of uh, tolerance. Well, so we're going we're gonna to get to this concept of uh, being led away by, by philosophy. Uh, this writer argued with him because he wasn't tolerant to people with different views. Now, this word beware, uh, all the way through, means various forms of be aware. It's not so much being wary, uh, being afraid, or anything like this. It's being aware. Open your eyes to this thing. See? Beware. Notice this. Pay attention to this. The first one I want to share with you is Matthew 7.15. Jesus said, Beware false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, 
but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You and I don't have the ability to see the inside. It is not a, a wise thing for us to begin to imply improper motives to people. But God does see the heart. And so when he tells us what's inside, we should pay close attention. Especially, they look so nice in those sheep's clothing, you know. They look decent. Adam Clark talks about ravenous wolves whose design purpose is to feed themselves with the fat, clothe themselves with the fleece, and thus ruin instead of save the flock. This is why we are not going to be tolerant of false teaching. So you're just being particular. I guess so. If there's a true doctor that gives me proper medicine and a false doctor that prescribes a poison to me, I'm not going to be tolerant of that. It means life and death. And in this case, more than life and death, eternal life and death. Jameson Fawcett Brown's commentary says that they are bent on devouring the flock for their own ends. This is using the people they're preaching to. You see? Ravenous wolves. Matthew Henry said, look, every hypocrite is a goat in sheep's clothing. But a false prophet is a wolf in sheep's clothing that comes not but to tear and devour, to scatter the sheep, to drive them from God and from one another into crooked paths where it's easier to creep up on them, get them individually. So be prepared to compare others' teachings with the Word of God. Now, this supposes that you know the Word of God, that you've paid attention, you see, that you know the Word of God. <clears throat> and now, you don't just say, they seem like a nice person. This is not what this is about. Compare it to the Word of God. If they are not true to the Bible, be afraid of the consequences of their lives. This is... This is uh, Red Riding Hood listening to the, the wolf saying, uh, my big eyes just to see you better. The second passage, two passages actually, Matthew 16, verses 6, 11, and 12. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And so the disciples went and said, oh, leaven, leaven, he, he, he's worried we don't have any bread. <laughs> and so finally in verse 11 and 12, <clears throat> how is it you do not understand that I speak to you not concerning bread, you should be aware of the leaven, but that you should uh, be aware of the, uh, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then understood they how he made them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Their false teaching. Mark 8, 15. And he charged them saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod, the political leader. So why does he say leaven? Well, leaven has, like a yeast, is, a, is has the characteristic of growing and pervading the entire lump of dough. This is, this is the way false teaching works. You tolerate it, you accompany it, you grant it, and it'll pervade everything in your life. If we neglect <clears throat> to avoid false doctrine for ourselves, we will be absorbed in it. If we do not declare our opposition to false teaching, we allow it to pervade our culture our culture. Uh, we won't stand up against false teaching in the larger culture. A third one is Philippians 3, 2 and 3. 
And uh, some strange words here, it seemed to me. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Evil, in this sense, lacking virtue. That's the focus of this word, evil. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. So the three things here. First of all, he mentions dogs. Albert Barnes points out that dogs in that day were mostly uh, strays, wild, uh, feral, you know, the uh, no, no uh, uh, lassie helping get people because Timmy fell in the well. This is, uh, these are dogs that are snarling and ready to bite you and give you diseases. He says, the term dog also is used to denote a person that is shameless, impudent, malignant, snarling, dissatisfied, and contentious, and is evidently so employed here. We ought to be aware of that. Now he says, you're not going to know he's a dog. <laughs> but if you, if you catch a glimpse of that growling attitude, beware. Be aware of that. Then evil workers. <clears throat> Jameson Fawcett Brown say, not simply evildoers are meant, but men who worked indeed ostensibly for the gospel, but worked for evil, serving not our Lord, but their own belly. We recognize that there are some dogs that um, might come across to us saying, reject your restraints. They're keeping you under. They're not letting you uh, uh, go with you know, your, your true feelings. Do what feels good. Then there are the evil workers. Some false teaching promotes ungodly living as a right by God's grace. Told you before, I found late at night one time on TV, there was a guy all dressed in white, had a white hat, sitting on a chair, smoking a great big cigar, and he was preaching the gospel. I said, well, I've never seen this before. <laughs> and... Uh, forget his name, but, but the point was he, was he was flaunting his ability to do whatever he wanted because of the grace of God. And we'll find these. But he says they're actually working evil. And then this word concision. Albert Barnes explains that the word rendered concision is kata tome, and it means properly a cutting off, a mutilation. It is a way of looking at circumcision when it's, it's just a cutting of the flesh. It is used here, he says, contemptuously for the Jewish circumcision in contrast with the true spiritual circumcision, which he mentions in the verse. <clears throat> we worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Jesus, not in the flesh. So um, that's what these, these things. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, these are the people that are preaching circumcision uh, to get better with God. You know, I, um, we had my boys uh, circumcised because it's a healthy thing. God invented it, and we, uh, we appreciated that. But uh, we didn't do it to help them be uh, loved of God. Some of the false teachers are clothed in an ultra-religious clothing. You need to do more. The false teacher approaches us as super godly and ultra holy. A famous preacher, preach against sin and preach against eating potatoes because it's uh, bad for you. See? And uh, you couldn't help but enjoy listening to the guy, but he went too far. <laughs> Uh, you can give me diet tips all you want. It's just don't tell me that this is, uh, this is how I please God. He says, have no confidence in the flesh. You will recognize these false teachers, even though they're, they seem to be ultra holy, because the teaching that they give is emphasizing physical ritual and denying certain things for the flesh. 
It's a, it's a, a flesh-oriented thing. Again, Colossians 2.8. He says this, Beware, lest any man spoil you. And the King James margin here explains spoil. It means make a prey of you, seduce you, lead you astray through philosophy, the love of, of wisdom, and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments or the elements of the world, and not after Christ. Let's be clear that the Apostle Paul, who wrote this, um, uh, was fully aware of a great deal of psychology. Intellectualism clothes us in the pride of learning. It was Martin Luther who pointed out in one of his writings that the first time we find Satan, he's at the tree of knowledge, and he says that he's been there ever since. Uh, he, he debated, you know, uh, salvation with the, the doctors of his day, uh, doctoral teachings. So Paul was deeply educated in human Greek philosophy, but he called it vain deceit. What does that mean? It means empty deception. He reveals it to be the rudimentary, the elementary thinking of the world. He says, don't think you, you understand everything now that you've studied philosophy. You've just been wading through the garbage of the elementary things of the people. God reveals worldly philosophy. He does this in James 3.15. This wisdom is, uh, descendeth not from above, but is earthly, born up from the earth, sensual, this is the word actually soulish, just of the soul, of the mind, will, and emotions, and devilish, meaning literally dem demonic. This is not something you want to base your life on. It's uh, this center one, uh, earthly. It's just temporary. It's just of the earth. And then finally, in our first point here, is 2 Peter 3, 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeking how you know these things before, beware. This is uh, a couple of words that actually trans could be translated, be on guard. Not just be aware, but be on guard. Lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. He's writing to believers, isn't he? But he says, I want you to be on your guard. Does that give you a picture? You, you've got your, uh, what, night goggles on? You've got your rifle on your shoulder? You're marching back and forth at the parapet, you know, looking down, seeing who's coming to attack. What he's saying is, if we drop our guard, then that error will lead us astray. That's the sad part. See? We will end up in compromise of our faith and sad failure in our life. We don't want to do that. So stay on guard. The attacks are around every day. Every uh, TV show that's not, you know, a religious broadcast, or a Christian broadcast, I should say, is trying to convince you of something. It's trying to preach some worldly idea to you. Be on guard. Recognize what it's trying to do. All right, the second big enemy of the church, and this surprised me, that this was the major thing. Favor with men. Your desire for it, your happiness with it, it compromises your stand. Let's look what Christ had to say. Because when we stop seeking God's favor by obedience and begin seeking men's favor, we will turn into a sinful life with its tragic consequences. But everybody's doing it. I don't want to be thought odd. Matthew ten seventeen. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. You see, make no mistake, he says, 
the world of men does not love God or God's ways. You may seem to have their favor today, but tomorrow they will dispose of you any way they can. Don't trust in man's favor. Beware of men. This is what they do. They're unsaved. Secondly, Luke 12, 1 and 15. In the meantime, when they were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, and this time it's not so much the teaching as the hypocrisy. Verse 15, he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So two things here was the, the leaven of the Pharisees. Uh, their, their false teaching led them to hypocrisy. And that is pretending to be something they were not. Uh, hypocrisy is not that you, um, you think something is wrong, but you do it anyway. You're just, you're just lacking strength of your conviction. Hypocrisy is when you, you say, I don't do it, but you do it anyway. You're pretending, you see. Hypocrisy and covetousness often walk hand in hand. Hypocrisy is acting as if you are holy, but you really have another motive for your actions. You're not doing this because you're holy. Covetousness is the desire to fill your appetites beyond what God has given you. God has given us appetites, has he not? We have a hunger for food. We have a, a desire, a thirst for a proper liquid. We have a need for sleep. We have a need for some measure of comfort. But when we're not satisfied with what gives it, God gives us, we want more and more. I want more sleep. <laughs> I want more food. Uh, that's, that's where it turns into covetousness. 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, which means desiring more fleshly comforts than we need, the lust of the eyes, desiring more wealth than God has given, and the pride of life, desiring to lord it over others. He says these three attitudes, that's all the world makes of this. But it's not of the Father, it's of the world. Notice with me then again in Mark twelve thirty-eight, He said unto them in his doctrine... Be in his teaching, beware of the scribes, because of what? Which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces. Again, in Luke 20, 46, beware of, and this is the phrase that means turn your mind to, pay special attention to this, the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues, and the chief rooms at the feast. Boy, they like to be showered with the preferences. Now I want you to think about this for a moment, <clears throat> because you can have your, your Christian heroes. That's all right. Um, don't strive to be the Christian hero because you want the privileges of of being the hero. Here the temptation is to act in such a way that it gives us preference before men. This gives in to the pride of life when you desire recognition as a holy person. Do not walk in such circles. Don't, don't find yourself attracted to the elite that you fill it in. Even if there are advantages, Jesus commanded us to consider these people to avoid them. Turn your mind to them. See. Now this idea of turn your mind to them is the idea of marking them in your, in your thinking. Now I found out that we are to consider all kinds of people and avoid 
some and imitate others. The same idea of marking. Notice the two passages. Romans 16, 17. Now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine, to the teaching, which you have learned, and avoid, turn aside from them. Here is that William R. Newell, the intemperate one. Um, he says, there is the ever-present danger of our very Christian charity making us unwilling to deal with righteous sternness toward others who are doing deadly work. If anyone was known to be causing selfish divisions or had become an occasion for others falling, contrary to the doctrine when they had learned of, when, which they had learned of Paul, their only path was to turn away from them. You don't turn away from the sinner. You turn away from the false teacher, you see. Concerning many professors of Christianity, John Bunyan, John Bunyan said, a man will go far for his belly's sake. <laughs> so why, why is he in this if he's not a true Christian? Because it's a living. So listen to this again. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. This is our concept of heresy. It comes from this division. Divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And what are we to do? We're to avoid them. Avoid them. See? This is a false teaching. And this is the pride of men to say, I, uh, uh, I want you to do it this way. He says, turn aside from them. Don't associate with them. Then there's another marking, and we find this in Philippians 3.17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Here's marking them. Here's putting your mind on them. Noticing them for the purpose not of avoiding, but of imitation. Albert Barnes <clears throat> The exhortation here is to mark, that is to observe, with a view to imitate those who lived as the apostles did. We should set before our minds the best examples and endeavor to imitate the most holy men. I think you should actually look around and find a good example, find a holy person, and cultivate their friendship. Say to them, you don't know me, but I would like to be your friend because I like what I see in your life. He goes on to say, a worldly and fashionable professor of religion is a very bad example to follow. And especially young Christians should set before their minds for imitation and association with the purest and most spiritual members of the church. And he doesn't mean your local church uh, there necessarily, but all, all believers, professed believers that you, that you can meet. So it's one of those things where we recognize what the church must realize. And that is, we're in for a fight. There are people who hate us, and there are people who have dedicated their lives to leading us out of the steadfastness from the Word of God. This is what God says. They'll do this by telling you the false doctrine and by encouraging you to curry the favor of men. Jesus said, beware, be aware of these things, of these pitfalls, and avoid them both. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, we come to you with a recognition that we are not of the world while we have to live in the world. I ask that you might so work that our hearts are challenged to be a proper soldier in the fight. 
not to um, curry the favor of the enemy, which is Satan and sin, but to seek to change the people who are dominated by the enemy and win them over to you. Father, we're looking at a world that has gone crazy. Over a hundred murders now being recorded for the Indianapolis area. Six people shot, injured, killed last night. I ask that you might so work that we might recognize that the world is not our friend that is trying to lead us astray. And part of that is so that we can be accepted by them. Both of these are to be rejected. Father, you have told us that let God be true and every man a liar. We will not sidle up to those who disagree with you, even if they truly, truly believe it's true. We will recognize the truth is defined by you. Now I ask, Father, you might guide and direct us and help us to see that we just dare not, we can't afford to think about this world as that pleasant place that uh, we're just happy to, to blend in. We're not to blend in, we're to stand out. I ask that you might help Open Door Baptist Church to take that stand by the individuals that are members here. I ask that you might help us to recognize that we are in a fight and we dare not be misled or be led to favor with men. So we pray thy blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.